Weigel, who is going to be talking about the all scalar set hierarchy, which is music, uh, the future of music theory. Uh, Steven is a music media production major who also is a composer, yeah. does lots of composition. Yes. And um, take it away, Steven. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm going to be talking about something that I call all scalar set theory. Now, set theory really isn't uh, too complicated, but it's sort of a mathematical discipline that involves counting objects. And this theory has sort of arisen in my work because I'm interested in other tuning systems. So we just define another tuning system as the tuning system that doesn't use the piano's tuning. Uh, so all scalar set theory is a way to categorize scales that are outside of the regular tuning system and you can use it to uh, specify properties of scales that are within the octave. So again, if you're back to the piano, if you go from one C to the next C, that's an octave because they sound like the same note. Uh, and usually music theory revolves around the octave. So you can have a non-octave scale, but then it makes the theory really weird and hard to understand. So this theory is going to stick with octaves. Uh, the permutations and partitions I'm using are mostly combinatorics, uh, like factorials and stuff like that that you would use in probability. And partitions are just uh, used to sort of parse out the scales. Like if I have a seven tone scale, I could have, you know, six kinds of one tone plus one kind of another tone, or five kinds of tones plus one kind of a second kind of tone and one kind of a third kind of tone. That's what the partition tells you. And of course, it's only about the counting of objects and not actually about consonant tuning, uh, which is a big subject in tuning theory, but isn't addressed here. I think this will make it easier for the current establishment to use it. It's sort of like a bridge between theories. Uh, okay, so we're just going to talk about how set theory has developed uh, over the years. Uh, we see all of our notes here, our lovely notes, we have 12 of them, and they are all an equal distance apart from each other, so this note sounds the same distance to this note as this note does to this note, etc., etc. So that's called 12-tone equal temperament. Uh, around the time of the 20th century, uh, there were some composers <coughs> who, well, <laughs> I mean, around the time of the 20th century, there were some composers who decided that they sort of wanted to change it up and create more dissonant music. So then it became more convenient to label the pitches with numbers instead of letters. So... Voila! The piano is converted into numbers, and we see that 10 and 11 here are just digits, and they didn't write out 10 and 11 because that makes characterization awkward. So this is a really great way to label post-tonal set theory, and this labeling method is known as a pitch class labeling method. You just label each pitch with an integer, but the reason that my theory is different is because you're actually labeling the sizes between steps. So with this configuration, we have converted the notes into a chromatic scale, and each pitch class just gets one number. Uh, but with step sizes, you have uh, a similar phenomenon where, like, let's say I was going up two, uh, or from C to D, I could go from zero to two, and if I went two, that would be a step size of two. Uh, and then if I had other step sizes of two, I could label it with the same step size letter, which is what we're going to get into. So the reason to use step sizes, I mean, the main reason comes from the fact that you have to uh, look at similar relationships between tunings, and it's a lot harder to do that if you're labeling with pitch classes. Like, let's say I had 20 notes in an octave and had to label numbers like, you know, 0 through 20, but I wanted to create a scale that I could also find in 12. Then I would have to, like, kind of rethink how everything works and recount all of the numbers. But if I label everything using step sizes, I have something common to both that's very easy to spot, and it's sort of really easy to go between tunings with it. Uh, the Zen harmonic community, Zen harmonic and microtonal mean the same thing, it just means not piano tuning. Uh, they already use this kind of method to lab label scales, but they don't call this labeling method scalar class sets. That's just a name that I've come up with, and I actually don't even know if it's okay to use it yet, because they've been using these for a long time, and they just have no name for these things. Uh, these things that use L, S, and M to label the step sizes. Uh, L being the large step, S being a small step, and the M's just being various kinds of middle steps. Uh, the Zen harmonic community uh, has mostly been interested in investigating steps with two sizes because it makes things simpler. 
but I'm investigating other stuff, including steps with three sizes. Well, <laughs> I was going to talk about how awesome the scalar class set is, and it is awesome. That's supposed to like spin out and solidify in the middle, but you guys already know what a scalar class set is, so I don't care. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So now, let's convert a pitch class set to a scalar class set to get the basics down so you can go tell all your friends about this after this is over. So here we have the major scale, and it's in prime form. Uh, a prime form in pitch class theory just means that it's compacted the most to the left. So see how I have a one step here and then a one step here? Uh, both of the one steps are as far to the left as they can be. So that's why it's a prime form. So then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, well, fill in the spaces and see what the steps are. Look at that. There are two step sizes that have the size of one and then, oh, five with a step of two because we have to take the last step size again as if we were going around the octave because, of course, we're repeating at the octave with adjacent pitches. Uh, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just label them by their size, but take the numbers out so I can use them for any tuning. So the one step size is going to be a small size, and the two step size is going to be a large size. So now we have two smalls and five larges, and we can call this 5L2S, uh, which is sometimes the major scale and sometimes not. This is, this is broader than talking about the, uh, the pitch class terms, because if I shuffle the S's and L's around, watch what happens. On the second line, I'm going to scoot an S over. Watch. Oh, there we go. It scoots over. Now it's a completely different scale that does completely different things. And here in this third one, I'm going to scoot it over too. Oh, no. We've got three different ones now. So it turns out 5L2S can actually say a lot of things. <laughs> These are the three kinds of scales it can create. But of course, if I didn't want to be in 12 tone equal temperament and I wanted to create it some 5L2S of a different quality, I could say, hey, I'm going to make L 17, and the S is going to be 4. And then you can multiply 5 times 17 plus 2 times 4 and get a really big number, which would equal how many pitches you have in the octave. So this kind of thing is best for equal temperaments, uh, which is the kind of temperament we have, actually. Uh, but yeah, that is sort of how this works. So then these three different scales, uh, I'm calling them normal orders for now. Uh, although they're also prime forms. These are terms borrowed from pitch class set theory, but it's kind of a new application. So that's why things can get a little muddy. So this is an example of the first permutation I found that is able to categorize these kinds of scales. Uh, the total number of tones, now let's use 5L2S as an example, our beloved major scale, which we always use as an example. Uh, the total number of tones would equal seven, because it's got seven steps in it. And then these different tones refer to repetitions that get canceled out. So there are five large tones, so you'd put a five here. And then there are two small tones, so you'd put a two there. And lo and behold, when we plug everything in, we have 21 permutations. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, if there were only three back there, not 21, what the heck is going on? Well, luckily I have an answer to that. It turns out that if you take the scalar class set find its permutations, and then divide again by the total number of tones, you will usually, or sometimes, get, I mean, that word is a little muddy there, you sometimes will get uh, the number of normal orders, because when you rotate a scale, it sort of counts as itself, if that makes any sense. So when we had like LLS, LLLS, and we scooted it over, you know, if we were to scoot it over, we would have a different spelling, but then you could rotate it around and have the same thing again. The extra division of tones is like rotating it around. So that is sort of how that works. Now, some of the problems I've run into have been pretty interesting. And Dr. Emmert has helped me a lot with this. Uh, in music theory, we have things called transpositional symmetry and inversional symmetry. And their analogs in group theory are the quotient group and the palindromic permutation. And Dr. Emmert is solely responsible for teaching me those words, <laughs> which I did not know. Uh, so I will be researching them a lot uh, before my project is due. Uh, but anyway, I mean, these are just different kinds of redundancies. If you have a scale pattern that's like LS, LS, and you scoot it over twice, you have LS, LS again which requires another operation to figure out. And then an inversional symmetry only has to do with changing normal orders to prime forms. You remember how earlier I said a prime form was compacted most to the left? Well, if the prime form isn't compacted the most to the left, 
and it's not inverted, then it can be in normal order. So inversional symmetry only has to do with converting normal orders to prime forms. And transpositional symmetry has to do with permutations. So uh, when I figured out how I was going to try and categorize these kinds of scales, I've just come up with a hierarchy. So each thing sort of goes into the next thing. If I were to ask, okay, let's say I have a seven-tone scale. How many seven-tone scales can exist if we're using the octave? Then we could partition out the numbers and say, well, the tones could be split into like six kind of one tone and one kind of another tone, that whole spiel. And then the scalar class set would tell you which sizes those tones were. So like if I had six of one kind of tone and one kind of another tone, there's nothing saying, oh, well, the six one is the large and the one is the small one. You know, the six could be the small and the one could be the large too. So that is what the scalar class set does. And it turns out you can figure out uh, this value with yet another permutation, just like this, which we've already gone over. And then the character is something I'm currently looking into. It's uh, how a scale can change if the step sizes are changing. So that's sort of the, the whole area there. And it bridges a lot of gaps between microtonal music theory and pitch class set theory. So now I'm going to try and play some sound samples. We'll see if they work. Uh, these will be different kinds of scales uh, in different tunings, and we'll start with the major scale in a few different tunings uh, so that you sort of get an idea of how it would sound different. Um, so here is the regular major scale. Oh no, I bounced it with a click. Oh my goodness. Stop. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how iTunes works, so it's really annoying because things will automatically play. Uh, so, stop that. Okay. All right. So then uh, we move on and we try a 5L2S in 19. And here's 17. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it played twice, but yeah. Um, okay, so then here is a... <laughs> uh, here's another scale where I switched the large and small steps, so 2L5S sounds really exotic. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> okay. Hey, no random guitar music. <laughs> By the way, I literally don't know what that music is. Like, that is not on my computer. Um, okay, and then here's a, uh, here's just another exotic scale, 3L4S in 10 tone equal temperament. As you can see, I'm not the greatest at playing in time, but very exotic sounding regardless. Here's a cool scale in 19, 5L4S. And then one more, a scale I made up in 31 that I'm working on studying, which has five kinds of scale steps, which wouldn't get discussed in the microtonal community, because they only talk about two step sizes. So, ooh, cool, new area for exploration. Theorists take note. There we go. Those are all the random scales I have to show you. Thank you. <laughs> So many memories of my twelve tone theory class. Oh <laughs> Lord. Oh, you horizon is ear training. Oh. Um. <laughs>